Hello lovely people, how are you all doing today? I hope you're well. <laughs> I'm okay. Kind of same as same as same old. Um, yeah, just no energy is the main thing. Uh, I'm having a break from the garden. Just, I'm okay. <laughs> I just need to pace myself. So I thought, you know what, let's tackle a I must have a bit breathy today, I don't know why. Let's tackle a subject that was brought up by Ant, and I mentioned it in that low spend video on savings. Uh, I've been meaning to do this video for a few weeks, so yay, let's do it. And this was prompted by a comment from Ant. Hey Ant, are you well? I hope so. And he very simply asked in a comment on a video, can't remember which video it was, he said, how do you make ends meet and how do you get your bills so low? Two great questions and hopefully the prompt in my answers, hopefully some ideas to share uh, that other people can use. I think the very first thing that I need to say is one of the reasons I'm able to live on so little money right now Mm, there's probably about three or four different factors to it, but one, I don't have a mortgage. I'm not paying rent. I don't have a mortgage because I paid my mortgage off. Uh, and also, of course, for the last 12, 13 years or so, I've had the allotment, so I've been growing the vast majority of my own food. That's a huge saving every year. Now, I realise two things. One, there's a lot of people out there who don't have an allotment, but you can still do it in your back garden. Windowsills, anywhere, balcony. Uh, and two, people have mortgages. The thing with my mortgage, to say very quickly, and I don't mean this in a smug way, although I am quite smug about it now, is when I actually bought this place that I live in now, I bought within my means. I did not overstretch myself at all. I bought a studio. Now it's a massive studio in terms of square footage. It's more like a one bed flat in, uh, you know, I've been looking at this a lot obviously because I'm house hunting, but not seriously house hunting yet, not to the new year, but I have looked around and actually my square footage, I do it in meters. I'm a square meter girl, but um, anyway, um, it's about the size of a one bed flat, but because it's a studio, that brought the price down. Also, it was an absolute dive when I bought it. There was no kitchen, there was no central heating, there weren't windows. The kitchen window and the bathroom window, it was all boarded up. The front window was rotting and hanging off and threatening to kill someone in the street. It was an absolute dive, but because, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because it was a dive, it was, it was, I was going to say cheap, no accommodation is cheap, but it was cheaper and I was fully prepared to do the work myself. I'm quite good at DIY, but I was also prepared to learn and, you know, get in friends who are more skilled than me, either with carpentry or plumbing or wiring, electric wiring, whatever it was. I was prepared to ask them to come and show me and help me and what have you. So yeah, I took on a dive and I spent, in order to get it, not the bathroom, the bathroom came later, but in order to put the kitchen in, to put central heating in, I mean it had no heating at all, to put windows in, all of that, I spent about £10,000. A lot of money! We're talking 20 years ago, I bought in 2003. Uh, but that, I knew that that £10,000 was going to be a good investment because literally overnight I added about £40,000, £50,000 of value to the flat by doing that. So yeah, buy within your means, first of all, do not overstretch yourself with your mortgage. You know, how many bedrooms do you really need? And that whole thing about having a spare bedroom sack that off straight away you don't need a spare bedroom just buy a sofa bed a sofa bed for four or five hundred quid 
or an extra bedroom for thousands. Anyway, so that's what I did. Bought within my means and at the time of purchase, I, I could have put down a bigger deposit. I had a cash deposit from selling the previous place, but I kept some of that back for the do up got got filthy, rolled my sleeves up, got stuck in and did a load of the work myself which saved a whole load of money. So essentially, you know, the, the mortgage was small, the work was high but doable and all through those years of having the mortgage I was always overpaying. We've talked about this a little bit before but I was always overpaying. So, small mortgage, now paid off, makes it possible for me to live as I do. Having the garden, growing my own veg, that's a chunk off my grocery bills, helps me to live the way I do. Obviously that's changing. But fundamentally, um, <coughs> and I think this is where <coughs> some people would struggle if they were trying to sort of follow this route is everything the way it is now is a result of the way I've lived for years. This is kind of like, <laughs> it's a lifestyle choice. Even when I was working and earning, I thought decent money as a nurse, although when I now look at what train drivers are earning, I think, are you kidding me? Three times as much as a nurse? Anyway, um, <coughs> don't get political really. The point is, I was comfortably off when I was nursing. And you know what? Even now, when I'm not working, I feel comfortable. And that's a culmination, like I said, of, a, of years and years and years of habits. I've not gone from, you know, buying designer handbags, not even designer handbags, buying handbags and buying shoes and then suddenly I'm in the life I'm in now and like, oh no, I can't buy shoes and handbags, oh this is awful. <laughs> Just never bothered, never bothered with those things anyway. So this whole thing about lifestyle choices, where it all started, the fact that it is a, a lifetime of habits, I thought let's just kind of examine some of these. Look, I come from a family, a working class family, poor, or at least my branch of the family were, you know, my grandparents, my granddad worked, not in a great job, not in a great paid job. And they made the decision, God, late 50s, early 60s, to up sticks from London, move to Dorset. And that's where my grandma suddenly flourished. How old was she by then? She was born in 1918, let's call it 20, 40. So I think by the time they got to Dorset, my nan must have been about 45, 47. So kind of in a way, a similar age to me when I stopped nursing at 49. So granddad carried on working uh, in a not great paid job, but my nan, that's when she came into her own and set her mind to it. And, and that was where their self-sufficiency began or as close to, she was growing all their own veg. Uh, she started this project, <laughs> much to me, granddad's amusement about uh, breeding rabbits for both the meat and the pelt. I remember that so distinctly. I was about five. Oh, we used to love seeing the rabbits. If we went at Easter time, so many rabbits. But I was, I remember particularly one occasion playing in the outhouse. Just me and my sister on the floor playing in the outhouse. And I'd kind of lean backwards. The door was open. I'd lean backwards and bump my hand and be like, oh, what's that? And it's like, oh, my hand was bloody. And I think my mum had tried to keep it away from us, but I actually am glad that I was exposed to this. Um, there, was a, <laughs> there was a rabbit corpse hanging on the handle of the outhouse. Uh, so yeah, that's how, that's how they manage things. I mean, I learned really young 
how to gut and skin a rabbit. I'm vegetarian now. I've been a vegetarian all my adult life, but <coughs> I don't have an issue with people raising and treating well their own meat. And, you know, I'm not squeamish. Um, it's funny because I am a city girl, but in a way I'm a country girl. How many, put it this way, how many <laughs> of my city friends were like, oh yes, I'm doing my lovely lardy da shopping at the farmer's market. No, no, no. How many of them would know how to gut and skin a rabbit or even kill the rabbit? But yeah, so right from an early age, um, we were poor as church mice. My parents were divorced. My dad disappeared. Uh, you know, I grew up on a council estate, what you might call social housing projects in other parts of the world with uh, shoes on benefits. We had no money, no money. I used to go to bed hungry every night. I went to bed cold every night. <laughs> it's like, but, you know, I, I remember as a teenager being really resentful, but now I actually kind of appreciate that um, early start in my life. I didn't get pocket money. We didn't get pocket money. We didn't get pocket money. We didn't get treats. We didn't get birthday parties. We didn't get anything. We literally got fed. <laughs> that was it. The minimal of food. We got fed, there was a roof over our head, oh, that was it. We didn't have carpets, you know, um, and I'm not doing a, oh, poor me, poor me. I'm actually kind of, when I look back on it, thinking in a way I'm grateful because it taught me to be a little bit self-reliant and a bit resourceful. I was happy, I mean, I hated my home life, but I developed a fantastic fantasy life. I had great friends and we just play out. We just play out. We'd be filthy, cut scabby knees, blood running down our shins, blood on our knuckles for another fight. It didn't matter. We just, you know, my friends were great. And if I wanted something, you know, I'd whinge and whinge and then it would be like a slap round the head. You're not getting it, there's no money. So I learned really, really, really early on in life to not ask for anything. Don't ask for it because you ain't going to get it. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You're not going to, you can cry as much as you want for an ice cream, but you're not going to get it because there's no money. And, may, and that's a really kind of fundamental part of me now is that I don't... I know there's no point wanting something. There's no point going, oh, I wish, I wish, because it ain't gonna happen. Make the most of what you've got and the moment you've got. And really early on, I remember when I got to about the age of 12 or 13 and most of my friends, I mean, a lot of my friends, they lived on the council estate too. None of us had any money. But some of them were getting a bit of pocket money, probably because their mum and dad were on the rob. <laughs> That's the kind of estate I lived on. We got robbed. I caught the robbers in the act. It was um, Boxing Day. I don't know what year. How old was I? I was about 11 or 12. We were at a mate's house, all of us. And I got a game for Christmas that I wanted to play in their house. So mum said, well, you and I will call her Sharon for now. So me and Sharon went back round to our house, let ourselves in, and the robbers were in there. And um, one was in, right, so one was in the living room and one was in the bedroom, in one of the bedrooms. It was mine and my sister's bedroom. And he was in my sister's money box. <gasps> and it made me insane with anger. And I ran across the room and kind of did a kind of trampoline off my sister's bed. We had little twin beds, twin beds little dressing table either side, both of us matching money boxes that my granddad had made. I did this trampoline and jumped on this bloke's back and was pummeling, smashing his head, bashing him. Get off my sister's money box! Anyway, the long and the short of that night was I got really beaten up and half strangled by a robber, but um, we managed to get everything back because they lived on the same estate. I knew them. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of rough. So yeah, um, this thing about you know pocket money and people having it, it's like, oh, 
And it was made very clear to me that if you want, if you, you're not going to get pocket money. If you want some money, if you want to have a record player and if you want all that kind of stuff, go and get a job. So when I was 14, I marched off. There was a shop in the middle of the estate. There were a couple of shops. One was like a spa, like groceries. And then the other shop was like the newsagents slash sweet shop. So I marched off to them and I said, give us a job, <laughs> give us a job. Oh, what was that? It was a telly show, wasn't it? Oh, I can't remember what it was. Anyway, so yeah, I started work when I was 14. I worked every Saturday and Sunday. Obviously school Monday to Friday. Out with school activities like being in sports teams. I was on all, all the sports teams. Drama club, all that kind of stuff. So from the age of 14, I learned what the seven day week looked like. And again, that's, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> That's something that's put me in good stead for now. Because I learned at the age of 14 that I can do a seven day week, I can still get all my O levels passed and hold down this Saturday, Sunday job and do all my extracurricular stuff for credits and you know, what have you, looks good on your CV. And then I went off to do my A levels. That was a load of travel, but I still kept my Saturday and Sunday job. So yeah, it was, <laughs> I will say it was probably quite a rough upbringing in terms of, you know, lack of money, a rough, violent estate that I grew up on. And I, but I was really motivated, which is how, I, I'm really lucky, <clears throat> I acknowledge I'm lucky. I seem to do okay academically but also with kind of the, the arts and, and communication skills, I seemed to be okay. And I knew that I wanted out of that estate, I wanted out of that town, and I knew the way to do it was through working my butt off at school, despite the fact that I was getting beaten up every day for studying. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was, like, from the age of about 10 to 18, beaten up every blooming day. And because I'm a pacifist, I'd say, I can't fight you, I can't fight you. <laughs> Don't even do that to me. I used to surprise them when I hit back, but there we go. So that's kind of like, you know, that's the basis for where I am now. My grandparents were working through self-sufficiency. I grew up with no money on a rough as, I can't even begin to tell you how rough it was. You know, there were no guns on the estate. We don't really have that kind of, well, I think we do now. Uh, but there were plenty of knives and plenty of nasty people. But it really laid a foundation of, firstly, if you want something, you work for it. And secondly, if you've got nothing, make the most of what you do have. And that's kind of exactly how I live now, is I don't have much, but I make the most of what I've got and I love it and I enjoy it. But going through adulthood to now and coming back to this thing of Anne asking how do I make ends meet, <coughs> I come back to that thing I keep saying, is the, the, uh, there's that question in my mind of do I really need it? Do you really need it, Vivi? If you don't really need it, sack it off. Don't have it. So I'm now trying to bring myself back on point. The question was, how do I make ends meet? It's very simple. I am, I just don't spend. And I thought, I started to jot some notes down the other day about all these things over a lifetime that I don't do, where I haven't spent money and frankly wasted money. Um, and so much of this kind of feeds into how I was able to pay off my mortgage. You know, the vast majority of my friends my age, or certainly I paid my mortgage off when I was 47, certainly my 47 year old friends have not paid off their mortgage. Two parts of that, one I bought, I bought the tiniest place possible, the cheapest place possible, a lot of my friends at the time were buying three, four bedroom houses, even though there's only one or two of them. Anyway, but the big thing is 
this sort of general frugality all through my life. So I thought I would share with you some of the things I've never spent money on. This is quite fun. I think you might be a bit, yeah, you might, some of you might be a bit surprised. So for example, I have never, ever, never, ever have I, it's like that, it's like that party game, isn't it? And if you have, you've got to take a drink. I tell you what, let's play the party game now. <laughs> I'm going to get you all drunk. Pour yourself a glass of wine and have a sip if you have. So I have never, ever, referring back to my notes, I've never, ever bought a takeaway coffee or a takeaway tea or a takeaway hot chocolate. I have never bought a takeaway drink hot drink, whatever. I have, oh my goodness, so I have never ever, never ever have I gone into Burger King, KFC, Mackey D's, any of that kind of stuff. I've never gone into one of those fast food joints and bought food, ever. I have never, I know this will surprise some people, I have never, ever, never, ever have I bought a takeaway meal, ever. I've never had takeaway food, ever. I have never picked up my, you know some people have it, don't they? They have a drawer in the kitchen that's all the takeaway menus for the local pizza place and the local Indian restaurant, the local Chinese restaurant, and they ring up. And I have never done that in my entire life. Never, ever, ever. How much money have I not spent by not having coffee or a KFC or a Chinese meal? Um, let's see now. Okay, so these aren't the nevers, but they're the rares. You know that like we have loads of calves around the place. I've never had a greasy spoon breakfast. I've never gone out to a cafe for breakfast. Apart from if I've been away from home, for example, like when my sister and I go away, if it's a holiday, uh, unless I'm on holiday, I've never gone to a cafe to eat my lunch. I've never gone to a cafe for a sandwich and what have you, never. Eating in restaurants, I have done, but it's extremely rare, extremely rare. And it's usually a treat from a friend that's given to me. But I would say probably, hmm, I don't know, I was just thinking if I actually, I haven't written any of this down, but it, once a year, if that. I had lunch out at a restaurant a year ago that my two like really beautiful girlfriends who I used to house share, flat share with in Fulham Chelsea days. That was last year. Before that, I think the last time I ate out I honestly don't know, can't remember, honestly. So yeah, even eating out is rare. And listen, listen, this is not to say, oh, she's never had a takeaway, she doesn't eat out, she is really boring. I have not had a boring life. I have absolutely not had a boring life. Travel, I don't really uh, travel or holiday much now, but in my 20s and 30s, I traveled a lot. But it was always done super cheap. I used to travel on train a lot through Europe. Occasionally I'd, I'd fly. I have, I have flown quite a bit too much in my life. But then when I get somewhere, um, I didn't ever do hotels. I would, you know, sleep on the beach. Um, and if I wanted to be really swanky, you know, hire a room for a few days hire a cottage, hire a room on a farm, but yeah, never hotels, never all of that expense. So yeah, this, it's back to that question from Ant of how do you make ends meet? It's a lifetime of habit of just not spending unnecessarily, not spending on stuff that, listen, I don't think, 
I don't mind spending on an experience because experiences, they stay, don't they? They stay in our memories. They're wonderful. And I don't regret any of the spending I ever did on my travels in Europe. Not a second of it. I want to spend on food and a cup of coffee though. What an absolute waste of money. I would rather go without all those things and be able to save up to then have an experience that is memorable. I mean, hand on heart, for those of you who do buy your takeaway coffee or takeaway food, how many of you can hand on heart say, remember a really special takeaway? Maybe, maybe there are one or two out of 300. Ain't worth it. I don't do it. That's how I'm able to make ends meet. So now, <coughs> excuse me, and I don't mean that, like with everything I do, I don't mean any of it to be smug, holier than thou, anything like that. I'm just sharing, because I've been asked to, how I manage. That's how I manage. I don't spend on crap. So, in all, in, in the other part of the question was how do I get my bill my bills so oh, I'm so tired I'm so really tired from this blooming stupid COVID. How do I get my bills so low? Well you know what? They're not so low these days. First of all, in the UK at least, with both right, council tax, that's the tax we pay on a property. When I moved in here, I was banded at D, which is ridiculous. Ridiculous. I knew this property wasn't a band D. It's based on the value of property at a certain point in 1984 when, when all the banding was set. So as soon as I moved in, good old Martin Lewis, I went on his website and filled in all my paper. He had, he had a kind of a form that we could fill in, print off and send to the council. So pretty much straight away I got my property rebanded from a D to A. So A is the cheapest property banding that exists. And it reflects the fact that, you know, my property is just a studio and it had no heating, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so that immediately brought the bill down. Then the next thing I did was I applied for a single residency. That brings the bill down by 25%, which I think, think is unfair. It should bring it down by 50%, because if there were two of us and one of us moved out, that person isn't 25%, that person is 50%. Anyway, that brought it down by 25%. And then since then, when I stopped work, um, I had to wait a year because obviously my if when I stopped work my earnings on paper were still 20 grand a year but then after a year of being off work I could then apply to them to reduce it further on their means tested thing so I wrote to them with my I, I had to show my earnings for that first year of going wage free so that was a bit from YouTube, a bit from the shop, a bit from sewing. And from that, they then further reduced it. So there are ways to get your um, council tax reduced. Firstly, check out the band you're on and make sure you're in the right band. There are websites for that. If you go to Money Saving Expert, I think they probably still have something in their archive. Um, get your, make sure your banding is correct. And if you can lower your band, great. If you're a single occupant, apply for single occupancy, that will reduce it by 25%. But also, if you're on, if you're waged or on some sort of income, as I am, I am on an income, uh, do check to see if there's a means tested reduction that you can apply for. It's, you know, even if, even if you don't think so, say you've got your 25% reduction, write to them and say, this is all I'm earning. I'm earning a pittance, can you please reduce it? Then you will get the form where you have to, I mean, you have to do all your hoops and your box ticking and what have you. It takes a while. I had to send copies of my accounts and um, my tax. I had to send part of, because I'm registered on HMRC as a self-employed person. I had to send all that palaver. Got it sent to them. That reduced my council tax even further 
So I do pay council tax, <coughs> but it's really, really low. <coughs> and it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's a fair low, you know. It's not, I'm not not paying, <laughs> anyway, it's low, uh, but it's based on the fact that I don't earn much. So that's council tax. Water, at least with the Thames water, and I'm sure it is, I hope it is, um, I'm having honey and lemon, it's making me feel sticky and mm -mm. get back to water, that's better. Um, with water, in Thames water, there's another uh, solo occupant discount for 25%. Again, it just does my nut. It's like, oh, like if I lived here with a partner and the partner left, it's suddenly like, oh, but they only represent 25% of our water usage. What about their bath? What about their shower? Anyway, you can reduce your water bill <coughs> if you're a solo occupant. <coughs> I don't have a meter here. Uh, they can't fit one, so it's a, it's a fixed rate. I'm sure my water bill will be less if I had a meter because I'm really careful with my water. So for example, my bath water, after I've had a bath, I keep the bath water and I use it for watering all my indoor I don't have many indoor plants, but my indoor plants, but especially from March through till May, when I've got all the seedlings going on, I use it for watering all of those. So you could do that too, so that you're not spend, you're not, you're not turning on the tap and spending more on your meter. Um, bath water for flushing the loo. I mean, my bath is next to the loo. Most of us have a bath next to the loo. Just have a nice, a plastic bucket so you don't chip the enamel on your bath scoop up a load of water in your bucket, chuck it down the loo, boom, you're flushed without pulling that flush and turning the meter around. <coughs> as far as, you know, washing up, I just don't do it every day. Um, it's fine, you know, wash up once or twice a week. Wash up when you've got a lot to do, make the most of it. I think with, you know, the big things this year are, are gas and electricity, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you've heard all the tips, tricks, advice already. It's not really worth going over, but just simple things like, especially those of us who live in these old Victorian buildings, where there are drafts and creaks and cracks and what have you. So under my front door, I have a double-sided draft excluder because that because my floors are so wrong and the buildings like oh, the buildings are saggy as me. So when the floor goes like this, the door is across. There's <laughs> a big gap. So draft excluders, curtains. Draw your curtains in the evening before it starts to get really chilly. Any warmth that you've had from the sun on your windows, pull the curtains shut to trap that warmth in the house. Oh. Lights, I, I've i always preferred overhead lights. I like a lot of light, I like it bright, but right now I'm down to using, and I turn it on at the very last minute, I have one kind of overhead, it's like a standard lamp, it's an angle poisy, bendy one. And so if I'm doing close work, I can bend it down this way to light up my work. Although that doesn't really matter at the moment because it's summer, it's, you know, by that time it's like 9.30, but I can also turn it and point it up at the ceiling. And of course, because the ceiling is white, it bounces the light back so you get a bigger spread. So that's one lamp I'm using and it's got an energy saving light bulb in it. So it's using less energy to give me that light in the first place. Uh, I'm not using my oven at the moment as I'm sure a lot of people aren't. For instance, the other day someone was asking about garlic soup and I thought I'd love, love to make a garlic soup recipe. The only thing is, to make garlic soup you really want to roast your garlic. So what I will do, I'm thinking about it, I've made a note, is I will plan a day to put the oven on for an hour or so. And when I do it, I, there are quite a few squash, gnarly shaped squash left to use up. I'll halve them, whack them in, uh, put a garlic in, put all my other stuff in and have one hour blitz of doing 
whatever it is I want to do. After an hour, I'll take the meal out that I want to eat today, thank you very much, and all those squash that have been roasted, I can scoop out the flesh, because that's what I need, is to scoop the flesh out. Scoop out the flesh, freeze it, brilliant, I'm not cooking anything else that day. Have the garlic, brilliant. The next day I can do the garlic soup. So yeah, only using the oven <coughs> really, really minimally. And planning ahead so that when I do use it, I use every shelf. Um, yeah, to make the most of it. It's just, you know, it's really simple things like, I love bathing, I love a bath. Having a bath is one of the only times when my joints are free for a minute. I kind of float in the bath, oh, and it's so beautiful on my joints. But there's no way, I mean, I used to have a daily bath years ago, and now I've cut it right down to one bath a week. I hate it. I'm really grumpy about it, but that's the way it is for now. And obviously the rest of the time I just do a cowgirl wash. <laughs> pits and bits, do me pits and me bits. Um, <coughs> sorry, I don't know why I did that voice. So yeah, it's, look, I think it's common sense, isn't it? As we go, you know, it's coming up this winter. Oh, the one thing I did want to say though about the bills. Ah, I started a graph. Let's say 150 quid. 50 quid let's say at the mo this is at the moment based on March's um, price cap increase it's going to go up again in October you know I was talking about the fund fund the other day the fund fund might become the fuel fund so it's obviously it's gone up so it's now looking like in the winter today obviously it's not the winter it's going to be about 150 a month it's currently, oh that's too low actually, I put it in too low, it's gone up to about 70 a month in the summer and it's, that's freakish, it used to be like 35, 40, but that's where we're at. So at the moment I pay by direct debit and I pay the same amount every month and I pay 80. So let's say That line across the middle, that's me, sorry, excuse me, that's me paying 80 quid every month. It's a really useful way to budget, actually. So that in the summer, you can, you can see where this doesn't work anymore. I am going to, I think I'm going to put it up to about 100, 110. Oh my God. But this is how it has worked and worked brilliantly in the past, is over the course of the year about half of the line would be below what I was paying every month and half of the line would be above what I was paying every month but the two equaled out so in other words I'm overpaying in the summer and I'm building up credit building up credit building up credit building up credit and then there comes a day in the autumn around about the end of September beginning of October where oh the actual charge for my bill is the same as what I'm actually paying. So I'm kind of equal. Equal in about April, equal in September. And then October, November, December, January, February, March are all way higher than what I'm paying, but all that credit I built up in the summer is paying for it. And there were some years where I would get to the end of March using I'm going to have to pretend there's another graph here. I'd get to the end of March using this year's surplus credit built up. And actually I would have overpaid by maybe 100, 150, 200 quid. And at that point I would say, I'd like a refund please. And that would be a lovely little chunk of money to put towards, you know, something fun or another big bill or pay off some of the mortgage, whatever it was and then start building it up again over the summer and you get the idea. So I think, <clears throat> I think that's a really, I know some people don't trust online anything and they don't trust these direct debits and the one thing I always do is I read my meter every single month on the same day and I feed those readings into my account so that I know I'm accurate and where I am where I should be and doing this direct debit, uh, they wanted to raise it two years ago and I said no, you're being silly because actually 
I'm in credit and they were like oh yeah you're right fine but I think in t if you're on a really really f frugal low amount of money I think it's easier to budget the same amount per month let's say I go from 80 to 100 I would rather find £100 every month through the year and know where I'm at than in the summer go, oh, it's only 60 quid, yay, holiday. And then in the middle of winter they go, it's 160. And I go, oh no, I haven't saved up for that, I haven't got that, I haven't, I'm clobbered, ah. <coughs> so I think, <clears throat> I think that would be really useful if you don't already do it is if you switch to a monthly direct debit and also generally direct debit paying by you a lot of companies I know this across the board of all of mine from contents insurance to my water payment all these things it's you get a bit a tiny bit of a discount for paying by direct debit the same amount monthly through the year they offer that because for the companies it's better because they know they've got that money coming in every month. It's not like sending out a bill that someone can't pay and then the company have to spend money chasing someone down to pay that amount of money. So I think it's definitely worth looking at, can you pay by direct debit monthly uh, rather than waiting for a bill to come in and then go, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna manage it. Spread the cost, but spread it throughout the whole year. Um, and then there are, there are there are going to be bills which you can only pay annually. They will only allow that. So it's back to that very beginning of this year when I was saying if you have bills that are annual, car MOT, boiler uh, maintenance, um, what else might come once a year? Maybe your insurance bill comes once a year is to look at that sum again, break it down into 12 months, what would it cost each month, and start putting that 12, that individual month's payment away. Imagine you're actually paying it to them up front right now, you're putting it into a savings account so that when the annual bill does come, it's not a panic, you've got that money set aside, you've been setting it aside all year, there we go, I can pay without stressing my little head off. Right, <laughs> well, as is the case at the moment every day, I'm now feeling really tired. I've enjoyed actually chatting about all this to you. Um, I, hope, I hope some of it helps. I think, uh, look, there are two big, 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 like bottom line things in all of this. And that is, it's a habit. And if you're not in the habit at the moment, in other words, if you fritter, and I don't mean that in a patronising and a, and a judgmental way, but if you are frittering your wage away every month on nothing, maybe start a book, a little notebook in your bag, and every time you spend a single penny, make a note of it, because then that will help you to see where you are losing money, throwing your money away. But yeah, I think, I think, not being sucked into spending and being a consumer it is a habit and hopefully any of you who are trying this low spend year this year any of you who've been following for a while and picking up little hints and tips along the way are starting to get those really healthy financial habits you know checking your accounts knowing where you're at getting rid of your debt starting savings all those things and even if you're my age and you're just starting it now, well, great, because you've got another half of your life to go. Um, so it's not too late to start being frugal, to start being money savvy, to start saving, and to start thinking a bit differently. That's what it boils down to, is it? So next time you reach for the phone with a menu in your hand, ask yourself, do you really need it? Dear, dear, dear. <laughs> Do you really need to eat Chinese food that night? And you know what, if you really feel the need, maybe you can pop to your supermarket, buy the ingredients, watch a YouTube video about making a, I don't, I don't eat Chinese food. What do you eat in China? I don't know. I can't, I really don't know. I don't eat Chinese, uh, okay, let's change it. So it's pizza. Let's say it's Friday night, you wanna reach for the phone and you wanna have a pizza and it's, 
10 quid, I don't know, is it 10 quid for a pizza? But maybe you could say to yourself, you know what, instead of reaching for the phone and getting a pizza for 10 quid, I could walk to the supermarket and get a pizza base for two quid. I've got stuff in the fridge, I've got tomatoes, I've got cheese, I've got some basil, I'll make it myself for two quid. Put the phone down. Put the phone down, put the menu card away, you don't need it. You don't need it. I wish I knew how to do cartoony stuff on uh, videos, like I'd like my eyes now to go in circles, you know like, oh what's the name of the snake in the jungle book? Trust in me, trust in me. <laughs> I want my eyes to go like that, you don't need a takeaway. Simple really, isn't it? Stop spending. Stop spending on stuff you don't need. <sighs> right, I need to lie down now. So I will see you all again really soon, I hope. Uh, don't know what I'll be doing, but I will no doubt be sharing with you because it's really, really fun to share. So until the next one, cheerio, gorgeousities, stay well.